Ladies and gentlemen, uh, time for our next debate, next discussion, exchange of opinions between our distinguished guests who kindly agreed to join us today in Cambridge on foreign policy with uh, history speeding up. I'll just give it a bit of time so that the rest of you can come and join us quietly. So with history speeding up, as we can observe at the moment, the momentum of, momentum of Polish foreign policy is actually crucial. That's something quite obvious. It's crucial for the next decades to come. Not even years, but decades, decades and I'm not exaggerating here. With all the dangers and um, threats that are there, that are sort of lurking from behind the uh, global threats, we need to take the decisions, or the politicians that we elected need to take decisions that will really make decisions about our future. We know that we have to minimize all the threats that are there for Poland, for the continent, for the world, but also to make use of the adva take advantage of the chances that are also on the table if we have a look. I read in the time yesterday or day before yesterday, I, I can't remember, maybe you have as well, it was actually widely distributed on the, web, uh, on the uh, internet, Mikhail Gorbachev, the former Soviet leader, who said this, and that's a direct quote, it looks like the world is preparing for war with a question mark, and obviously it's a big, big, big question mark. Perhaps we will get a little bit closer to the answer to that question today. And this is not an easy thing to discuss, this is not an easy thing to proceed with in this shaky... Wow, <laughs> quiet, Monsieur. I did it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In this shaky... <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, so I'm rounding it up. It's not very easy in this shaky period of, uh, of the time when the transatlantic foundations for the post-war peace seem to be at least coming to an end. The question, and the crucial question is, what next? Right, the panel on foreign policy will be chaired and moderated by Dr. Stanley Bill, lecturer in Polish studies here at Cambridge. Stanley, the floor is yours. All quiet. <laughs> Uh, thank you and welcome to this debate. Welcome to the University of Cambridge. I'd like to, I think, begin by inviting uh, the participants in this debate to the stage and very briefly reminding you uh, of their history and achievements. First of all, Radosław Sikorski, who, as you all know, is a Polish politician who's held positions including the Marshal of the Same, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Donald Tusk's cabinet. He previously served as Deputy Minister of National Defense in Jan Olszewski's cabinet, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Jerzy Buzek's cabinet, and Minister of National Defense in Kazimierz Marcinkiewicz and Jarosław Kaczynski's consecutive cabinets. He studied philosophy, politics, and economics at the University of Oxford, where he was also president of the Polish Society. And he has also worked as a reporter from locations such as Afghanistan and Angola, and published several books. Could you please welcome Mr. Sikorski to the stage? Our second speaker is Professor Andrzej Nowak who is a Polish historian and academic working at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, as well as at the Tadeusz Mantofel Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. His main research areas are cultural and political history and thought of Eastern Europe in 19th and 20th centuries, political philosophy, international political relations, and modern mass media. He's the author of four books, some 60 historical publications in scientific periodicals, and dozens of articles, reviews, and interviews, many of which were underground publications in the period up to 1989. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Arjen Novak. It is a 
truism and perhaps a platitude of Polish historiography to say that Poland's geopolitical location has always been, to put it lightly, inconvenient. <laughs> Over the last hundred years, this has been particularly clear, and a core, fundamental, underlying fact of Polish raison d'etat has been the painful truth that Poland's security is dependent on external guarantees. Next year we will celebrate 100 years since Poland returned to independence in 1918. The symbolic dates that testify to the dramatic failure of these external guarantees since that time are 1939, 1945, Yalta. But then since 1989, one of the core assumptions of Polish foreign policy is to establish this security through relations with key international players. Again, the symbolic date, 1999, the entry to NATO, 2004, the accession to the European Union. Now, of course, Poland is by no means unique, indeed, far from it, in its neighborhood, in relying on these guarantees, on the international order, and on international cooperation. And for that reason, I think we have all observed with great disquiet the developments of the last five years. And to raise another symbolic date, 2014, and the annexation of Crimea by Russia in direct contravention of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum guaranteeing the territorial integrity of Ukraine. These are the challenges with which Polish foreign policy must grapple. This fundamental painful truth about Poland's existence and independence is the truth that all Polish governments must face. But the approaches to this truth and how to secure this aim of security and prosperity in a changing world for Poland have been very different. And this is where the debates, the discussions, the arguments, and sometimes the accusations have been particularly dramatic in recent years. And that is why I want to bring together two figures representing very different perspectives, defending very different perspectives on how to achieve this goal, which I believe is a shared goal on all sides of Polish politics, but with different ideas on how to get there. And therefore, I would like to pick up Professor Pelczynski's motto that he raised earlier as a guiding justification for this discussion, Zawsze Łączyć, always connect, bringing together representatives of different perspectives on Poland's vital core interests. And that's why we see these two figures uh, before us today for this debate, which is ultimately a form of dialogue. And in a Poland which has seen entrenched polarization, of the political scene, dialogue is more and more necessary, crucial, indispensable. So with, after that short introduction, just a couple of technical aspects to give you a sense of how this debate will unfold. It's a somewhat amorphous style. It's not the Oxford debating style. It's something closer to a, a presidential debate where, and it, in fact it's interesting that both of the figures on the stage before me have at one time or another uh, been attached, at least loosely, to the context of a potential presidential candidacy. So perhaps it's fitting. But in any case, I will be asking some questions of each of the speakers, giving them time to respond, then giving the other speaker time to respond to those comments in a critical way. And we'll go backwards and forwards like this, focusing in particular on the foreign policy of the last two Polish governments. Although there's no need for the speakers to limit their remarks um, to this context, uh, this is uh, simply a guideline. So, 
we will begin with Mr. Sikorski presenting the rationale and achievements of Polish foreign policy under his watch, or more broadly, under the PEL, PSL government. Then Professor Novak will respond to that with a critique of that foreign policy, and then Mr. Sikorski will have time to respond to that critique. The next section, Professor Novak will present and defend the rationale and achievements so far of the peace-led government. Then Mr. Sikorski will have time to critique this foreign policy, and then Mr. Novak, Professor Novak will respond to that critique. Finally, I will ask both speakers to present their visions for the future of Polish foreign policy, the challenges, the opportunities contained within. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome to the floor Mr. Radosław Sikorski to present the rationale and achievements of Polish foreign policy under the PEL PSL government. I will ring a bell, uh, which will give you 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. I will be rather harsh on timekeeping in the interest of fairness. Please welcome Mr. Sikorski. Mr. Chairman, drogi Zbyszku, Excellencio, <coughs> Szanowni Państwo, uh, <coughs> of course I'll speak in English. Uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, I, I walked here from the hotel and I have to say I am very impressed with the beauty of Cambridge. All those centuries ago, when I was myself a student in the United Kingdom at the University of Oxford, I heard that some dropouts from Oxford uh, traveled north and set up a university. <laughs> and, and I am impressed. Uh, well done, congratulations, you, you've, you've done really well. <clears throat> but speaking seriously, um, the, uh, one of the previous times I debated uh, Polish and uh, international affairs in an Oxbridge format was in the 1980s. And the uh, motion before the House was, this House believes that the enforced stability of Poland is essential for the peace of Europe. Leszek Korkowski and I debated and we defeated the motion. But may that motion be an illustration to you how far we have traveled. In those days, it would have been an unimaginable happiness for us to see Poland as a member of NATO, to see Poland not just independent, but prosperous and an important member of the European family of nations. And here's where we are. And whereas there are some dark clouds on the horizon, Poland is an independent country determining its own foreign policy. And before I come to, um, to what the content of that policy is, uh, since we're in an academic setting, let me define my terms. What, what is foreign policy? I, I would um, try to persuade you that even though Karl Marx is not my favorite philosopher, the statement on his tomb in Highgate Cemetery in London, philosophers have described the world. The point is to change it is not a bad summary of what foreign policy tries to achieve. Foreign policy is to use all the instruments at the disposal of any one state, diplomacy, the economy, the army if need be, to raise that state's standing international, in the international system by comparison with other states. Foreign policy is always relative to other actors. First, of course, you need to uh, provide sec basic security for your nation, for your, for your state, but also you want your state to grow in relative importance. And of course, you cannot achieve that by simply stating your aims and perhaps even condemning those that disagree with you and then expecting that the rest of the world, other actors in the international system, will just adjust to you. 
particularly if, as Poland, you are a medium-sized country with um, limited resources. Poland is a, a country with 7% of the uh, population of the European Union, about 3% of the economy. So how do you actually do foreign policy? How do you persuade other states to do what you want? Well, if you're an empire, if you're a superpower, you can force them. But if you're Poland, you have to persuade them. You have to persuade your partners, your allies, and your adversaries that to do what we want is in their better interest. And let me um, delve into the um, most difficult subject with our most difficult neighbor, namely the Russian Federation, because Dr. Bill encouraged me to, uh, to go there. Russia is, of course, um, a uh, country with uh, a recent imperial experience. Russia is a country that uh, has uh, been a, a remarkable example to the world of how not to conduct your affairs. And uh, Russia goes through these spasms of uh, extreme dictatorship, um, Ivan the, Hor the Terrible or Joseph Stalin, and attempts at westernization. Uh, and uh, the uh, advent of uh, the government of the civic platform and, um, and the Polish um, uh, Peasants' Party uh, happened during a time when Russian leaders were declaring that they were ready to modernize, that they were ready to integrate, very broadly speaking, with the West. Russia uh, has been joining institutions of the West, the Council of Europe, the World Trade Organization, um, G20, uh, and was uh, aspiring and was in the middle of negotiations to sign a partnership and cooperation agreement number two with the European Union. Uh, and in fact, there was a, um, a, an embargo on Polish agricultural produce the previous government worked to lift that embargo. We managed to get it lifted. And um, uh, uh, tremendous economic opportunities opened up to Polish entrepreneurs. And uh, when Russia tries to uh, modernize itself, I believe it is in Poland's interest to encourage those tendencies. Um, when you are a, a, a public policy official, you can't always say what you think about any one country. British ministers, when they go to Saudi Arabia, don't call their hosts uh, Muslim fundamentalists. When we go to North Korea, we don't start the conversation by saying, you nasty Stalinists. Uh, you sometimes have to uh, guard your language. Um, but you try to give your partners, particularly adversaries, um, you, you try to give them choices, a bad choice or a good choice. And the good choice in the case of Russia was collaboration with the West, so that imaginably Russia would do what our great um, compatriot John Paul II dreamed of, that Europe would breathe with two lungs, the Catholic lung and the Orthodox lung. And, and Russia as a, as a country that might conceivably integrate with the West would be a final em embodiment and embeddedness of Poland in a context that, was, uh, that would be geopolitically more secure. And of course, it was always uh, not very likely that uh, Russia would stay the course, but some good things happened. Um, uh, the Polish church started a reconciliation process. Uh, we uh, had business opportunities. President Putin, Putin came to Westerplatte and acknowledged that that's where the Second World War started. Uh, Prime Minister Putin was the first Russian leader who came to Katyn and honored the um, murdered Polish uh, POWs. And thanks to that pragmatism, Poland received a reputation for a country that could be trusted on Eastern affairs. So that when we proposed the uh, first and largest Polish initiative in the European Union, Eastern Partnership, a plan to bring six former Soviet countries uh, to integrate with, them, with the European Union, the European Union backed it. So that when 
blood was starting to be spilled in the, uh, Kiev, in the Maidan, I was able to organize a, a European Union mission in three hours to go and, and um, uh, mediate and to um, get a deal which, as a result of which, today 93% of Ukraine is pro-Western, is reforming, and is approaching the EU, whereas Russia, which tried to stop that process, is still under sanctions. This I put to you, if my time is running out, is the definition of a successful policy by a medium-sized country. And I just hope that our successors have similar successes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to this distinguished university and place. I'm coming from provincial Krakow and Jagiellonian University. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, share with you a slightly different perspective on uh, the past uh, 10 years of our foreign policy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the situation in, in which we are placed here is a really adversarial. Uh, we should uh, confront our positions, we should shout at one another, and maybe in the end, as two aides, we should shake hands, that will be the best for the public. And this is not a very good situation for anyone who deals with foreign policy. Foreign policy needs consensus. This is uh, something that makes foreign policy different from any other policies. And if I would uh, address the most dramatic problem with uh, POPSL government foreign policy, it was the fact that it was the first government that broke the consensus over foreign policy in Poland, or at least that minimum of consensus that was observed by all previous Third Republic governments. That consensus was called, usually briefly, Giedroyc Doctrine. Uh, Minister Sikorski several times addressed this as obsolete, as not valid anymore, and maybe they, he had uh, reasons for that. Uh, he, he will, he will be uh, able to, to answer, of course, this. But um, I'm afraid uh, uh, that uh, foreign policy was made hostage of an internal vendetta against uh, peace government, exactly as Minister Sikorski declared during the public uh, campaign in 2007 that uh, the goal is to, uh, to slaughter the horde. Uh, and as long as it, uh, is, as it comes with uh, internal policy, this is not maybe the best way to describe your opponents, but uh, it can go. But if you move with this uh, attitude to foreign policy, it brings really destructive results. What kind of destruction do I mean? I will stay uh, on the policy towards Moscow. So actually, yes, uh, Minister Sikorski decided, together with Prime Minister Tusk, to change the usual tradition of all previous uh, Prime Ministers and Foreign Ministers to go not to Kiev as the first, or Vilnius as the first capital in the East, but to go to Moscow. Moscow first was the... Okay, you... you sorry. Uh, yes, but the most important visit was right made in February 2008 when nobody visited President Putin because he was a lame duck president and this was the time of election in Russia and no foreign visitor from the West intended to go there. But Prime Minister Tusk intended to show that he can make a breakthrough in the relationship with Vladimir Putin. Well, whether he made this breakthrough, I would say that he was used very effectively by President Putin because it was exactly the moment when President Putin hosted Prime Minister from Ukraine, Yulia Tymoshenko, blackmailing her with gas blackmail stoppage at that moment. And Polish presence in Moscow at that time and not in Kiev made an evident, I would say, shouting bridge to Giedroyc doctrine. 
So Moscow first, yes, and it was done in February 2008, a year after Vladimir Putin declared in Munich conference new Cold War against the West. He spoke quite openly. And it was exactly at the moment when NATO Bucharest summit, several months later, uh, presented once again uh, Vladimir Putin's attitude, Vladimir Putin's attitude to, to Russian neighbors, where he declared that Russia is an artificial state that usually stayed under Russian umbrella. And this was stated publicly in Bucharest. And after that, after that, Prime Minister, Shik sorry, uh, Tusk and Minister Shikorsky decided to strengthen even this uh, direction, Moscow first, Kiev uh, rejected as a real partner. Uh, Minister Sikorsky made uh, even something like a doctrine from this position in his expose in March 2011 when he declared that GNP is the real measurement of the importance of our partners in the East. And he stated, he compared Russia to Lithuania and to Ukraine. Russia has something like 10,000 bigger GNP than Ukraine and something like 150 times bigger GNP than Lithuania. So that's with whom we should speak first. Okay. But what we got for that, for that Russia first policy? First we got gas deal renewal. Uh, and I have to give uh, 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 my uh, honorable opponent uh, his due. He stopped uh, the, the most ugly consequences of this deal that was prepared by Vice uh, Prime Minister um, from PSL that uh, intended to keep us dependent on Russian gas to 2037. Minister Sikorsky and uh, Commissar Ettinger intervention changed a bit these uh, uh, obnoxious, I would say, consequences, uh, uh, prolonging our dependence only to 2022. But what stays as a fact is that we pay for this gas something like 20 to 25 percent more than anyone from Western Europe. So we didn't get anything material for that uh, Russia first policy. Uh, we, got, uh, we got instead a uh, ban on Polish food exports, ban on Polish trucks, transit, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and introduced again. And introduced again. That's how Russia operates. Okay. But the most uh, tragic consequence we got is an internal split in Poland when our foreign minister decided to criticize our acting president who shares responsibility uh, with uh, foreign minister and prime minister for our foreign policy uh, and to criticize him in really rude words when uh, Lech Kaczynski visited Caucasus and Minister Sikorsky decided to joke about it and said that instead of playing brave men and roaming around the Caucasus he should be rather more predictable. And this was time after Russia invaded Georgia. And still after that time, Minister Sikorsky decided to host, to greet uh, Prime Minister Putin during his Westerplatte visit with an article published in Gazeta Wyborcza where he declared that Russia was at that moment the most democratic and the uh, best abiding human rights in all her history. That's how it was stated. I have this article with me. Uh, so it was exactly at the moment when uh, Sergei Magnitsky was in jail, where another historian was put in jail for studying Gulag, Mikhail Suprun. It was exactly at the moment when Russian army were practicing in Zapad uh, training uh, so-called tactical nuclear attack on Warsaw, exactly at that moment when Minister Sikorsky wrote that. And it was exactly after uh, Anna Politkovska was killed uh, on the uh, birthday anniversary of Vladimir Putin or uh, mm, uh, so many other uh, instances I can, I, I can show here to say that there were 
solid evidences to persuade anyone that Vladimir Putin is not the person to make any deal. And in making this deal, you try to persuade that your opponents are just stupid Polish Russophobes who have no idea how to make foreign policy. The consequences were the split of visits between president and prime minister in 2010 and more tragically, the deep internal split in Poland. I will end with this quotation. Quotation from uh, Radosław Sikorski interview given to Ben Judah. Once, this is about Putin. Once you've spilled blood, once you had apartment bombings in your own country, once you've sent death squads abroad, once you've had uh, Georgia, Ukraine, and all dead bodies, you can just let go. This is how he portrayed Putin, as a dangerous criminal, capable of anything. But right half an hour after Smolensk catastrophe, Minister Sikorsky officially excluded any possibility of Russia responsibility for that catastrophe. Moreover, Minister Sikorsky left, and Prime Minister Tusk especially left, all legal powers to prosecute that case to the very prosecutor, Yuri Chaika, who led Politkovska, Magnitsky, Litvinenko cases, the most compromised prosecutor in, I would say, all legal history of the 20th century. And that's how it operated. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Sikorsky to the lectern uh, to respond. I'll give you a little extra time uh, as uh, Professor Novak also went a little over here. Thank you, and I, I, I'm at a loss where to begin. Well, let me just say, Professor Novak, that uh, personal attacks and misquotations and mistranslations uh, is not what persuades people at a great British university. Maybe there's a reason why uh, this university is in the first tenth of the world universities, and um, I'm afraid Polish, not all Polish universities are in that league yet. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but you heard um, that because President Putin is, a, is an autocrat, um, you cannot deal with him. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, Professor Novak, the whole world deals with Russia. Russia has the, the, the kind of government uh, uh, she deserves, just like we do, and, um, and I'm afraid we have to deal with it. Um, the, um, I, I don't want to go through the list of, uh, of uh, I think, uh, remarks that were not, um, that were not uh, motivated by fairness, but let me just... Um, say that it is, it is, it is just uh, remarkable that one is being accused of having made the correct hypothesis about the Smolensk air crash, that it was uh, caused by pilot error and by people wanting to get to a ceremony too early. You know, when you fly a plane below the level of the airfield, and that's where the presidential plane was before Smolensk, you are up to hit a tree. And that's what happened. And you represent a political movement which is based on a conspiracy theory, on a, uh, a lie that there was an assassination there. And you promise to find the evidence. Six years have passed. You have not found any evidence. But you continue to accuse one side of the political uh, um, divide in Poland of treason because we will not endorse your conspiracy theories. I agreed to debate you here because I read an essay by you which, which I found um, profound, namely that we need more unity, we need uh, more common ground. I agree with that. But you're not going to achieve common ground when you, in effect, accuse your opponents of treason, of murdering the president of Poland, which is what you've just done, and I don't accept it. This is what is ruining trust in Poland. And it, the authors of that are in your political camp. But let's get to what I thought we would be this, uh, uh, debating, which is Poland's Eastern policy. 
Professor Novak, I respect your knowledge of Russia, but I think you are fundamentally misreading the Gedroyd Doctrine. The Gedroyd Doctrine was not about um, uh, being always necessarily hostile to Russia. It was about helping our Eastern neighbors, non-Russian Eastern neighbors, to become independent while having as pragmatic a relationship with Russia as possible. Well, if you grant me that, that I read Gedroyd correctly, then I would grant you this, that yes, I have tried to amend the Gedroyd Doctrine. Not its essence, not its purpose, but its tactics. Yes, I think Poland's biggest tragedies historically have occurred when we have overestimated our capacity to affect events. Our national uprisings, for example, always ended in tragedy because we were facing impossible odds. I believe Poland should be stronger, not braver. And therefore, my aim as foreign minister was to use the entire power of the European Union for the purpose of realizing Poland's Eastern policy aims, for the purpose of integrating uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, and so on, and for the purpose of civilizing Russia. That was, yes, the difference, but I think it was right and as we are now seeing with the new government, which is not in good standing in Europe, what have they achieved? We um, managed to drag all of the European Union to Kiev so that Ukraine, the problem of Ukraine was the problem of all of Europe, not just of Poland. If it had been a problem just of Poland, nobody would have cared much. And one last word. Um, uh, we should really, when we discuss foreign policy and Poland, Polish politics, we should base uh, 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 our pronouncements on facts. In Poland, Article 146 of the Polish Constitution states very clearly, the foreign policy of Poland is run by the cabinet, not by the president. You had a, the British have a head of state too. If the Queen went mad, she might go and insist on taking part in the European Council or in foreign policy meetings, and the government would have a problem with that. And so did we. I would like to now invite Professor Novak to take the floor again to present the rationale and achievements of the new peace government in foreign policy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my honorable opponent uh, stated that uh, the problem with, uh, with a neighbor which is powerful and actually adversarial is that we still have to have a relationship with, uh, with that neighbor and this is absolutely truth. Uh, and every government had some relations, different relations with, uh, um, uh, with uh, Russia, and there were different stages of Russia, actually, after 1991. But uh, I am uh, here to, uh, at the moment to speak about uh, the last one year as compared to the previous eight years of uh, POPSL um, government policy. So um, I would like briefly to uh, present a method of dealing with Russia that was reintroduced, uh, I would say, with a partial success, uh, with the new government. So if you have a dangerous, really dangerous neighbor with neo-imperialist agenda, that it was inevitable to understand, even at 2007 or 2008, after the first war against Georgia, you have to do everything possible that next, any next effort of this neo-imperialist aggression would be stopped, would not be possible. Security is the key. And here, Warsaw NATO summit of July 8, 9, 2016 was an evident success. 
And I am absolutely ready and happy to acknowledge that this was a success built by a series of governments and consumed by the last one. And actually, it was only organized by the last government. That's, that's how foreign policy should operate. But the success is evident. The fact that uh, there is a deployment of military units uh, from uh, the states and from Western Europe to the Baltic states and to Poland from January this year, something like 400, uh, sorry, 4,500 American soldiers stationing in, in Poland, British contingent uh, in Estonia and so on and so forth. This is something that is, a, I would think, a proper response to a dangerous neighbor. Because in order to make this kind of relationship, Minister Sikorski intended, with goodwill, I'm sure, to introduce 10 years ago, you have to make impossible for Vladimir Putin and the likes to continue with their policy and to make their policy unpopular at home with less successes. So NATO could help us with that. Uh, another element from that point is uh, uh, that NATO took control of U.S. built uh, missile shield um, in Europe, in Redzikovo, also in Poland. This is also important. So we will stop with this just one example of security policy connected to NATO. Another one is energy, uh, energetic security. And again, an example of continuation, a project that was initiated by peace government in 2007, was built by POPSL government and was opened by peace government in 2015, in December. A huge liquid gas port in Świnoujście makes us less dependent on Russian uh, gas blackmail. This is very important, but this is not enough. The goal is to make 2022 as the breaking point in our relationship in Russia. Not in, uh, in the terms that we will not trade with Russia anymore, but from that moment we should not be blackmailed by Russia. We should take any possibilities from Russia of that blackmail. And for that reason, Minister Naimski from uh, the current government is uh, preparing a concept of Baltic pipe or uh, as a part of a so-called Northern Gate that would uh, hopefully bring to Poland gas from Norway uh, shelf uh, through Denmark. Uh, uh, this project should be realized in 2019 and uh, would be operative in 2022. So I think this is also important. The third element which I would like to stress is regional cooperation. If we had, because Minister Sikorski is right, we had problems in communicating Western European capitals our perception of Russia. That's, that's right. But there are other countries in the region that have similar perception of Russia, not all Russia, but Vladimir Putin's Russia and to organize more effectively a cooperation between these countries is something vital. This is not just Visegrad group. This is not just Orban Kaczynski axis that is misportrayed by most of the press in today's world. But this is something different, so-called Three Cs project launched by President Duda as a, as a concept that unites especially Poland and Romania as two very important, I would say, players in the region and uniting other countries between Black, Adriatic and the Baltic Seas. Uh, of course, we have divergent in many elements um, perceptions, but many of us, like Poland and Romania, have a similar perception of Russia and we have common interests within the European Union as a group of countries within the European Union. So the concept of this three Cs that was launched in Bucharest 2016 and will have another summit this year in Wrocław is something I think very promising, very important 
and very material too, because there are projects of huge infrastructure, energy and transportation infrastructure elements connected to that. Then another element is our bid for membership in the Security Council, of course, a non-permanent uh, uh, seat in the Security Council of the United Nations 2018. Something very important for our place in the world. Also, openness for Far East. The breaking visit of President Duda to China last year was something really important and promising for our uh, economy. Probably Prime Minister Morawiecki will be able to say more about that. But the most important and final point I want just to make is that we intend to have, I believe, our government intends to have its own sovereign voice in an internal debate over the future of Europe because we would not be able to exist outside of Europe, outside of United Europe, but we shouldn't just ape Germany or other powerful partners who have their own interest in reconstructing Europe. We shouldn't ape Brussels oligarchy. We should take as an equal partner in all European debate how to revamp Europe. Know how to bury Europe, but how to revamp it. Thank you. I invite Mr. Sikorsky to present his critique of the conduct of foreign policy under the current government. Well, maybe stay here, but um, you know, if you want to have a, a policy of, um, of uh, stopping Russian imperialism, good luck with your uh, uh, alliance with Hungary, whose government, jumping the gun, yesterday announced that uh, uh, sanctions on Russia to do with Crimea are useless and should be dropped. Um, this is the kinds of uh, alliances that uh, the new government is uh, uh, nurturing, uh, instead of trying to be in the decision-making uh, uh, circle of the European Union. And the trouble with the decision-making uh, circle of the European Union, from that point of view, is that it includes Germany. And they just cannot bring themselves to see uh, Germany as a a regular, friendly, allied country. When they talk to the Germans, they always see a potential Nazi. And there is a deep ingrained prejudice there against Germany, which is making it impossible for Poland to have a sensible uh, collaboration with Germany. And Germany is the largest shareholder with the, with the European Union, again, whether we like it or not, accounting for between 20 and 25% of the uh, equity in the EU. And so we had a Germany, Russia, Poland dialogue, which was remarkable and a wonderful instrument for Poland to, to, to know exactly what the, the two of them are up to and to have influence on both of them. Um, we had the Weimar Triangle, which is to say the core of all Europe, Germany and France, and it was the Weimar Triangle um, uh, ministers uh, that traveled together to Kiev to, to, to broker the deal, to save the Ukrainians uh, from uh, Russian aggression. Um, we were in the core decision-making uh, center of Europe. And now we are making an anti-Russian alliance with Hungary. Uh, congratulations. It's a great strategy. It will really work. Um, the point is that if you want to be influential in Europe, I agree with your objective of having a Polish input into the evolution of Europe. First of all, to save it, because its future is not assured. And I'm very glad to hear that you think the European Union is a good thing and needs to be preserved, because not everybody in your camp believes that. You have about one-third hardcore Europhobes uh, in the ruling party. But yes, I, when I hear that Poland needs to be as influential in the European Union as possible. I completely agree. But how to achieve that? Well, first of all, you can't be a leader of Europe when you're breaking European principles inside your own country. When the Council of Europe, when the Venice Commission, when the European Council are, are all considering sanctions on Poland. 
until very recently, we were sanctioning others. We were sitting in judgment on the democratic nature of other countries. And now we are being marginalized. Well, that's not a way to be a leader. So first of all, fix your internal policy. Make your peace with the European Commission. Make your peace with the Germans, with the, with the French. You know, the Chinese will take care of themselves. You know, I, I, I sometimes think that the Poland-China axis might not be a decisive axis in the, in, in the world today. Um, <clears throat> what we need is allies, because times are becoming really dangerous. Um, you're right that the uh, Russians exercise the use of nuclear weapons. I was the defense minister who published the Warsaw Pact um, uh, era exercise maps, which proved that the Russians were intending to use nuclear weapons from the first day of a conflict with the West. And it was my letters to the Secretary General of NATO and my public co communiques that brought uh, to general attention this issue of Zapat 2009, Zapat uh, 2013. And it was I who signed the uh, missile defense agreement, as a result of which we got the first US um, uh, uh, permanent presence of US uh, troops in Poland, for which the leader of the, uh, of the uh, current government wants to try me in Poland for treason. I'm not, I mean, some of you follow uh, um, uh, Polish media, and you know that this is true. Treason, because I was, you know, after all this, this is, this is how you bring the country together. This is how you build consensus on Polish foreign policy, right? Well, my advice would be make peace with Europe, try to become a, a more persuasive uh, and a more influential member of the European Union, because Poland on its own, even with Hungary as an ally, even with the Baltic states as an ally, simply cannot provide for its own security, for a very simple reason. They have nuclear weapons and we don't. And if they are as evil as you say, and I don't disagree, they are willing to use those nuclear weapons at least for political blackmail, if not actually. Well, if you internalize this fact, if you think this is really serious and really possible, and I think we agree on this, then, what is the first priority of the Polish government? The first priority of the Polish government is to give physical security to our people, which is to say that the evil that is out there, if it is to spill out on someone, it shouldn't, in the first place, spill out on us. We should not be braver. We should be stronger, more nimble and wiser. I'm really glad to hear that uh, there is uh, slightly more consensus uh, in, uh, between us, or at least I perceive it. Um, because in the beginning you tried to portray myself as an element of this uh, gang who believes in conspiracy theories and this should build, I believe, uh, like, uh, something like a civic atmosphere uh, of our dialogue both here and, uh, and in Poland. Um, so uh, I'm stating this because when uh, one tries to summarize all foreign policy of Poland for the last one year as an axis with Viktor Orban is making, I think, a caricature and not any real analysis of this policy. This is not Hungary versus Germany. This is Central Europe with Germany. I would like to enumerate the first visits of the new president. Visit number one was not to Moscow, but to Tallinn, to Estonia. Why? Not because we want to be brave, but because Baltic states really are a sore point on the map of NATO, are important, vital point for
for our Polish also security. But the next visit was not to Hungary, not to Bucharest, but to Berlin. And this visit was an evident success. And it was followed by so many other visits between German and Polish politicians in the last year. And now we are awaiting next visit of Chancellor Merkel in Poland. Caricatures that are drawn by journalists that give advice, to say the least, from Gazeta Wyborcza on, or from some other, not completely, I would say, objective sources in Poland, is not a reality of Polish, I would say, German or Polish, French or Polish, Italian or Polish, British or Polish American relations. So we should analyze these relations and not analyze caricatures. Uh, so Germany, yes, Germany is an important point in all of Polish government's agenda. This one government included. Uh, and if you read both Foreign Minister Waszczykowski, who was your vice, uh, your deputy for several months, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. He would never hire you, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but uh, if you just introduce this kind of atmosphere of uh, interruptions. Uh, but uh, uh, if you read carefully both his and our president's uh, statements concerning foreign policy, you will see how big importance is connected to our good, perfect relations with Germany. Yes, Germany is vital for our security, but it is important to enter into dialogue both with Germany and with other partners in Western Europe with stronger voice and not just repeating what Berlin said first, because this is the method to exactly realize what French ex-president said to Poland, to take an occasion to sit quiet and then not to make problems to big adult who run Europe. This is not going to be safe Europe for us. We have to have our say in this Europe. And we have to speak to our partners, like Germany, in order to persuade them uh, for our uh, perspectives. Uh, so maybe I will stay with, with that. Thank you. We're almost out of time. So I'd like to give each speaker three minutes to provide us with some summarizing points and perhaps some suggestions for the future priorities for Polish foreign policy. Well, list of visits is not foreign policy. Uh, if I uh, told you our list of visits, we would hear, we'll be here till the cars come home. Um, foreign policy is about affecting the real world. And just on a point of fact, you, um, you were just wrong saying that the, the uh, first visit of the Polish Prime Minister in 2007 was to Moscow. Uh, uh, we went together to Vilnius on my recommendation, also a Baltic state, uh, and also a country where there is work to be done and where successful, successive governments have tried to achieve things and uh, with, equal, <laughs> with equal success. Um, uh, and also be careful about uh, um, the presidency, because the president can have influence on foreign policy, but the Polish president does not run Poland's foreign policy. Read the constitution. It's the cabinet that runs the Polish foreign policy. And in the cabinet, what I can see is that the defense minister, for example, uh, makes decisions uh, without warning uh, that affect very adversely uh, some of Poland's key relationship, for example, with France, uh, which is a nuclear power, and which uh, until recently was sending more troops uh, to uh, NATO exercises in Poland than the United States was. We are entering very dangerous waters. We have a, a US president 
who perceives the world in a transactional manner. Uh, alliances are not transactions. Alliances are insurance policies. He might not even know that NATO has only been used once in defense of the United States. And he wants to extract trade and other concessions for al from allies for American protection. And what the Polish right about, likes about Trump is that he's equally retrograde on cultural issues and equally radical in uh, the, that kind of nativist, nationalist uh, rhetoric, even though his vision of the world puts Poland in real danger. Because from the point of view of Donald Trump, if Poland fell off a cliff tomorrow, he wouldn't even notice. Poland's security and success depends on a, on a Western, Atlantic uh, vision of solidarity, of uh, being um, together in, in building a safer world in which the rule of law, international law, and values obtain. And so we have a Polish government which has isolated itself in Europe at a time when the, a US president is dreaming of a grand bargain with the president of Russia. And by the way, he thinks President Putin is great. He doesn't think of him as, as we do. This is a uniquely dangerous position for Poland to be in. And therefore, I hope the Polish government will change course, will make peace with, with the rest of Europe, will steer back towards the European mainstream, and from that European mainstream, which might mean sacrifice. You know, it might mean, for example, having to adopt the euro currency, for which economic arguments are ambiguous. But, but for political reasons, Poland needs to be in the European core, because the third way leads to the third world, and in our case, to loss of independence. Treated by 
therapists who tried to teach them how to live in modern or postmodern world. And when you are object of a therapy, you are not a citizen. And to make citizenship viable is the first and the most important step to make any responsible foreign policy. And it is the process that takes place both in Poland and all other major nations of Europe. And we have to participate. We cannot stay with ideological cliches of yesterday. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this debate, uh, but it's gratifying to find among the exchange of different opinions some points of consensus. And I think we also saw the scar of the Smolensk catastrophe on the Polish political scene, and along with that, the personalization of politics that comes with it. And I think these are among the challenges facing Polish politicians, academics, activists on both sides of the scene who are committed to the idea of achieving that consensus that is so crucial to Poland's foreign policy. But above all, I would like to thank our two guests for being among those in Poland today who are confident enough to engage with others, willing to engage with others in a format like this one. Please join me in thanking Radosław Sikorski and Andrzej Nowak.